Today we're here to talk about clandestine laboratories where methamphetamine is manufactured. We'll be covering several objectives today to include defining the term clandestine laboratory, identifying the five types of clandestine laboratories, identifying and talking about the four most common manufacture methods of methamphetamine, identifying the five different types of laboratory processes, and identifying users of methamphetamine and the dangers that are presented by them to law enforcement, firefighters, and emergency medical services. How prevalent is methamphetamine in our society? Well, if you were to Google methamphetamine, you would get over 14,800,000 results uh, with that search. And you might ask, well, where do people learn to manufacture methamphetamine? Well, there are a variety of sources to include the internet. As just mentioned, the 14,800,000 results that you'll get from, from Google when you put methamphetamine in, in your search engine. The other ways, uh, there's, there's books out there that can be purchased through a variety of sources. One of the most popular being Secrets of Methamphetamine Manufacture by Uncle Fester. This is an extremely popular book on the manufacture of methamphetamine and other psychedelic drugs. Other books include Advanced Techniques of Clandestine, Psychedelic, and Amphetamine Manufacture. But the most prevalent way that cooks learn to manufacture methamphetamine is from each other. Now this makes this drug very unique. If for instance you had a, a cocaine dealer and in his neighborhood another cocaine dealer moved in, well, what would he do? He might A, shoot the other cocaine dealer, B, call the police and have him arrested because he doesn't want such a person in his neighborhood, or three, he could just simply take his business over. But methamphetamine's different. It's, it's believed that one methamphetamine cook will teach five other people to manufacture methamphetamine within a 90-day period. And they begin to work as a co-op, where one may have one specific ingredient for the cook and the other one doesn't. They can combine what they have and manufacture a batch of methamphetamine to either use or to sell. Let us first define what a clandestine laboratory is. It's an illegal operation consisting of a sufficient combination of apparatus or chemicals that has been or could be used in the manufacture or synthesis of a controlled substance. Now going back to some of our objective, objectives, one of which was types of labs. Well, clandestine laboratories are classified into five separate categories. One, extraction laboratories. Two, conversion laboratories. Three, synthesis laboratories. Four, tableting laboratories. And five, multi-process laboratories. Let's begin by defining an extraction laboratory. A finished drug is removed from raw plant or pharmaceutical material by use of a chemical solvent. The structure of the drug is not altered. Examples of this would be morphine from opium, hashish or hash oil from cannabis, and ephedrine from pseudoephedrine. Now let's define what a conversion laboratory is. That's where one form of a drug is changed into a more desirable form. Drug chemical structure again remains unchanged. Two great examples of this are crack cocaine from cocaine hydrochloride. In other words, regular white powder snorting cocaine is converted into crack cocaine. The molecular structure of the drug stays unaltered. Another example of this is methamphetamine being converted to the drug ice, which is a smokable form of methamphetamine. Again, the drug's molecular structure or chemical makeup remains unchanged. It's just converted into a different usable form. Next, let's discuss a synthesis laboratory. Raw materials are combined through a chemical process to produce a desired drug. 
The original materials may already be controlled substances. Methamphetamine from pseudoephedrine, PCP from piperidine, and heroin from morphine. Next is a tablet, tableting laboratory. The forming of a finished drug product into a dosage unit by use of a machine or gelatin capsule. LSD to blotter paper or window panes, GHB to dosage units, or ecstasy, MDMA, into its tablet form. And finally, a multi-process laboratory. Different types of laboratories or processes at the same location. A pseudoephedrine extraction lab with a methamphetamine synthesis or a methamphetamine synthesis lab with a methcathinone synthesis. The most common clandestine laboratories in the United States are simply this, a pseudoephedrine extraction lab with a methamphetamine synthesis. In other words, pseudoephedrine or ephedrine is being extracted from pseudoephedrine and then synthesized into methamphetamine. So now let's begin talking about the basic chemical requirements pertaining to a clandestine laboratory. Basic chemical requirements are necessary in order to produce the desired narcotic. They are as follow. One, precursor chemicals. Two, reagent chemicals. Three, catalyst chemicals. And four, solvent chemicals. Precursor chemicals. A chemical that is essential in the production of a controlled substance and for which no substitution can be made. For our purposes today, the precursor chemical is pseudoephedrine. This photo shows multiple punch packs of pseudoephedrine that were found at an actual methamphetamine lab as it was being processed as a crime scene. New state and federal laws and guidelines have been created such as the Federal Combat Methamphetamine Act that limits the purchase or the purchase amounts of pseudoephedrine. Often the size of the clandestine laboratory dictates the amount of pseudoephedrine that must be obtained for the manufacture process. But again, this is where attention to detail may save your life as a public safety officer. As you approach a residence for any reason, to put out a fire, to assist somebody having a heart attack, you could see anywhere from 20 to 200 empty punch packs of pseudoephedrine laying in the garbage, around a garbage can, or in a burn barrel. This attention to detail will allow you to, will, will allow you to know that you may be walking into a deadly methamphetamine laboratory. Now, to continue our discussion of the basic chemical requirements in the manufacture of methamphetamine, we come to reagent chemicals, chemicals which will react upon a precursor causing it to chemically change. These include iodine, sulfuric acid, hydrochloric or muriatic acid, sodium hydroxide, under the common trade name Red Devil Y, salt, that could be either common table salt or rock salt, Anhydrous ammonia is a dangerous chemical mostly used throughout the United States as either a fertilizer or a refrigerant, but it is illegally harvested by methamphetamine cooks and it's placed in unapproved containers such as igloo coolers, fire extinguishers, or most commonly a propane tank. This dangerous and corrosive chemical leaves a telltale sign as it flows through these unapproved containers and it is a blue or blue-green discoloration on the valve. Again, attention to detail can save your life. This chemical has an IDLH or is immediately dangerous to life and health at only 300 parts per million. These photos show where over 1,000 gallons of anhydrous ammonia were buried at a clandestine laboratory site by the methamphetamine cooks. After this tank was drained by a hazardous waste contractor, it had to be dug up and removed. The total cleanup cost to the citizens of the United States on this lab was over $120,000. Catalyst chemicals. There are two catalyst chemicals in the manufacturing process of methamphetamine. 
And a catalyst chemical is a chemical which speeds up a reaction process and or causes it to go to greater completion. These two catalyst chemicals are red phosphorus and lithium metal. What the meth cooks commonly do is soak the striker plate, just the striker plate of the matchbook in acetone and then can take an instrument such as a dental tool and slowly scrapes away the red phosphorus that's contained within the striker plate of the matches. Lithium metal is commonly harvested from lithium batteries. Here's an example of a common lithium photo battery that could be used in the manufacturer synthesis of methamphetamine. What the cook will do is actually cut away both ends of this battery and peel it down until finally getting to the core lithium strip contained within. One thing to keep in mind, especially for the firefighter, is that lithium metal is a water reactive and when it comes in contact with water may either flash over with fire or explode. Methamphetamine cooks keep their harvested lithium strips in Coleman fuel or mineral spirits to prevent explosion. Large quantities can be harvested and saved in these solvent liquids until needed for a cook. As first responders approaching the scene of a suspected methamphetamine lab, you should look for battery shells in and around the trash can, the floor of the home, or in burn barrels. Again, attention to detail will save your life. And now to our final basic chemical requirement in the manufacture of methamphetamine, solvent chemicals. And a solvent is simply a medium liquid in which a chemical operation takes place. Common examples of solvents found in methamphetamine labs are Coleman fuel, acetone, denatured alcohol, naphtha, methanol, R11, toluene, ether, freon, or any other organic solvent. Solvents, unlike precursor chemicals, if you think back to what we said about precursor chemicals, which was a chemical where no substitution could take place. Organic solvents are different, where one meth cook may prefer to use Coleman fuel because he thinks it's the best one to use, another one may use toluene. All of these are examples of things that can be used, or solvents that can be used in the manufacture of methamphetamine. For instance, heat, gasoline, antifreeze is really just methanol. Denatured alcohol is a common, common solvent found in a majority of methamphetamine labs, and acetone. Of course, one of the most important things to remember about any of these solvents is that they're all flammable. The reason that many of these laboratories catch on fire is because of these chemicals. These chemicals in and of themselves are common household items and you can find them in almost any garage in the United States of America. However, the meth cook during his extraction of the ephedrine from the pseudoephedrine pills must first grind those tablets up in a coffee bean grinder, blender, or just smash them up in a bag with a hammer. He then has to put them in a pot pour in a flammable chemical solvent and boil it on the stove of his house. The potential hazard that you face as a first responder is this. You as a firefighter or an emergency medical technician get a call to 132 Smith Avenue related to an older person having congenitive heart failure. As you arrive you have no idea that her two grandsons are actually cooking methamphetamine in the kitchen while she's having a heart attack. On the stove, they're boiling this deadly brew. They don't want you to know that this is happening, so they basically just stand in front of the kitchen door while you take care of the grandmother, leaving their boiling flammable chemicals unattended. A situation like this is where attention to detail may save your life, the first responder, and assist in saving the life of your elderly patient. As you approach this dangerous residence, you notice 15 cans of heat gas line antifreeze and multiple lithium battery peelings. You already know that you're headed into a bad and serious situation. My advice to you at this point would be to take your elderly patient 
and get her out as quickly as possible and do your fine work inside the ambulance and then report what you've seen immediately to local law enforcement. Another deadly chemical used in the manufacture of methamphetamine, regardless of the method of manufacture being used by the methamphetamine cook, is hydrogen chloride gas. You may be asking yourself, where do these cooks obtain hydrogen chloride gas? They simply make it themselves. They take a container, such as the gasoline can that's sitting in front of me, and the hose that's running out of it, and connect the two. Inside the can, they mix sulfuric acid and either table or rock salt, or another alternative would be to mix muriatic acid and balls of aluminum foil. Once this gasoline can is capped off and this tube put on it, the hydrogen chloride gas flows freely from the tube and into the methamphetamine oil to finish the process of manufacture. It doesn't have to be a ga gasoline can that's used. Anything, a Gatorade bottle, a Coca-Cola bottle, a Jack Daniels bottle, and any type of tubing, and the ingredients I mentioned can be used to manufacture hydrogen chloride gas. If you, the first responder, notice multiple bottles of any variety, from a Gatorade bottle to a Mountain Dew bottle to a Pepsi bottle to a Jim Beam bottle, with pieces of plastic tubing coming off of them, and either a brown sludge or a gray sludge in the bottom of it, you've most likely now encountered a hydrogen chloride gas generator. And one of the scariest things to you, the first responder, is this. Do you anywhere on this tank see an on-off switch? And because these items don't have on-off switches, you, the first responder, need to be careful what you kick, what you touch, and what you move. You may bump this item on a floor while trying to do your job. As we talked about before, the elderly patient having the heart attack, as you crouch over, you may bump one of these dead deadly hydrogen chloride gas generators with your foot, and all of a sudden, it starts to make hydrogen chloride gas again, even though the cook thought it had burned out or lost its usefulness. Hydrogen chloride gas, when inhaled by the first responder with no respiratory protection on, can cause first, second, or third degree burns to the sinuses, throat, nasal cavities, and lungs. It can also kill you. Now we'll begin our discussion of the actual methamphetamine production methods. Let's first start with the red PHI method. The chemicals needed to produce methamphetamine using this method are ephedrine or pseudoephedrine, our precursor chemical, red phosphorus, hydriotic acid or iodine crystals, sodium hydroxide, organic solvents, hydrogen chloride gas, and a heat source is required with this specific method of manufacture. With this method of manufacture, as I stated earlier, a heat source is required. If a person wanted to clandestinely manufacture using this method out, let's say in the woods or a forest somewhere, or at a camping site, they would most likely use some type of stove, propane burning stove. Other dangers to this method of manufacture include red phosphorus, which as we go back and review, is manufactured using the striker plates off of matchbooks, hydrogen chloride gas, which we talked about earlier, here's one of our HCL gas generator examples, and then any type of chemical solvent, such as heat, which is methanol, or acetone. The most dangerous thing about this method of manufacture is the production of phosphine gas that is created when ephedrine, hydriotic acid, and red phosphorus are cooked together. Again, this deadly gas is sometimes filtered through kitty litter, which is then simply thrown away in the trash can of the methamphetamine cook. Other times, this deadly gas is put in punch ball balloons and simply released into the atmosphere by the cook. The next method of methamphetamine manufacture that we'll talk about is the anhydrous ammonia method. The chemicals needed are, again, 
Ephedrine or pseudoephedrine are a precursor chemical for which no substitution can be made. Anhydrous ammonia, sodium or lithium metal, sodium hydroxide, organic solvents of some type, and hydrogen chloride gas. A heat source is not required, making this method of manufacture ideal for doing in clandestine locations such as in wooded areas. And again, just to review some of the items that you may see common to the anhydrous ammonia method of methamphetamine manufacture are anhydrous ammonia in some type of unapproved cylinder or tank, such as a common propane barbecue tank, sodium hydroxide or some type of drain cleaner, and most importantly, lithium batteries. But the most important thing to remember is attention to detail. It's all common household items in non-common quantities. Our third method of manufacture, part of which we haven't touched on yet, is the condensed ammonia method. The chemicals needed for this method are ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, again, our precursor chemical for which no substitution can be made, ammonium nitrate fertilizer, a 3400 blend, sodium or lithium metal, sodium hydroxide, organic solvents, and hydrogen chloride gas. Again, there is no heat source required for this method of manufacture. The condensed ammonia method is used when the methamphetamine cook does not have pure anhydrous ammonia available to him or her. Keep in mind that anhydrous simply means without water. And why would that be important? Well, when you mix Anything with lithium metal that's a liquid, it cannot have any form of water to it or you would get the explosion or flashover that we talked about earlier. Condensed ammonia is about 9% water but will not cause an explosive or flame reaction with lithium metal. The manufacture of condensed ammonia is really a distillation process. Sodium hydroxide, ammonium nitrate 34 zero zero mix which can also be found in medic cold compresses and a little bit of water are mixed together in a container. After those three ingredients are mixed ammonia gas then starts to pass through tubing that is submerged in a cooler in dry ice and acetone. As the ammonia gas is supercooled in the dry ice and the acetone, it drips off into a container via the hose and can now be used from this container by the cook as his manufacturing ammonia. Things to look for with this method of manufacture are igloo coolers approximately the size of the one that I have in front of me or larger coiled plastic tubing, dry ice containers, fertilizer, the ammonium nitrate, 3400 mix, or large quantities of those medic cold compress packs. The dangers of this method of manufacture are many, but some cooks have decided to make it even more dangerous. And instead of using dry ice and acetone to supercool the ammonia gas, they've decided to use liquid propane. We had an incident in my state where this was done and one of the cooks in the room decided to smoke a Marlboro while it was being supercooled, causing the single wide trailer that they were in to be blown to bits. Three of them ended up in a burn unit and one of them ended up dead. The final method of manufacture of methamphetamine that we're going to look at is the one pot or the shake and bake method. First, the cook must produce condensed ammonia, as described earlier, and perform the cook in the same container or pot. You use the very same ingredients as used in the condensed ammonia method of manufacturing methamphetamine. The container is usually a plastic soda bottle with a lid. It's the fastest cooking method with very little waste, which means very little evidence. You can easily burn or bury your laboratory evidence on site if you're an illegal methamphetamine lab operator. 
They are smaller cooks because currently pseudoephedrine is less available because of the new laws that we talked about earlier. The following photographs are of, are of recent examples of one-pot method methamphetamine laboratories found in the state where I work.